Hello, everybody. My name is Nigel Cook. Just uh, loading the slides. Um, and I'll be sharing my presentation today with Byron Jones. Uh, we both work for Novartis. Uh, we'll describe to you today the design of a patient preference study with patients living with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, as well as share some of the key results from that study. So this study was one of the 11 case studies conducted in support of um, IMI Prefer. So Prefer is a collaborative project under the um, um, governance of the Innovative Medicines Initiative, um, which began five, five and a half years ago now and is due to complete next year. Um, it's looking at the use of patient preference studies along the um, life cycle of medicines development and how the results from preference studies can be used to inform decision making. So disclaimers, both myself and Byron are employees of Novartis Pharma AG and the study that we'll present today was funded entirely by Novartis and then accepted by Prefer as one of the industry case studies. So this is the agenda for this afternoon. Um, so I'll talk about the background objectives of the study and then the study design and the pre-work we did there. And then Baron will be taking over to take you through the preference study results and some of the key learnings of the study. So just one slide really on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's a very common respiratory disease persistent in nature. Um, in the West, the most common cause, of course, is by through cigarette smoking, um, but it can also be caused by environmental um, agents, noxious particles and gases. And in some countries where they cook over open fires, that's also a common cause of the disease. Symptoms of COPD include um, breathlessness, breathing difficulties, um, but also chronic cough, excess mucus secretion are very common symptoms as well. Um, the disease has both an inflammatory component to it, but also remodeling of the airways, which is known as emphysema there. Um, those changes, of course, are irreversible in nature once they set on. Now, there are many drugs already available for COPD, but these are pretty much exclusively bronchodilators to help with the breathlessness. And those can sometimes be used in combination with inhaled corticosteroids to treat the inflammation of the disease. Now, what's interesting is if you look at um, typical COPD clinical trials, you find that the primary, though the main endpoints in those trials are lung function, a measure of the breathlessness, forced expiratory vital capacity, um, and then longer term consequences, exacerbation or hospitalization if the disease worsens at all. So that has really been the focus of regu um, regu uh, regulatory approval of drugs for COPD based on those um, primary endpoints. Research that we've done and also the literature on COPD suggests that there are a lot of other things that COPD patients suffer from, including excess mucus secretion, a chronic cough, um, sleep disturbance. Um, it can affect their psychological well-being, their daily activities, and potentially other symptoms as well. So this raises the question, how, questions, how important to patients are these other aspects uh, relative to the ones traditionally measured in trials? Um, is, would there be a value addition in, in treating some of these other symptoms of the disease? Can we measure them clinically? Are there ways through patient reported outcomes or through digital evidence capture to um, introduce these other endpoints into clinical trials? And then would their importance be recognized by decision makers, reimbursement agencies, or regulatory agencies as well? So we set up several years ago now a structured research process to, to look at this, beginning with desk research, um, followed it with social media listening, and then qualitative research in the form of online bulletin boards and in-depth interviews. And all of this was used to structure the patient preference study that we'll be talking about today. Um, the intent of all this is to inform the design of um, phase three trials 
Um, when we started this research, we were just in beginning phase one with a new drug for COBD. And we hope that the information here will then find its way into regulatory or health technology assessment body submissions in the future, and maybe also inform the design of new core outcome set for COBD and clinical guidelines. The Just to say the social media listening and the quality research give you a good feel for what it is the patients talk about and what's important to them. Um, but what you don't get from that qualitative research is how important these are, things are, how, how much things matter, relatively speaking, and what trade-offs they, they make. And that's where the patient preference study comes into play to really get that quantitative estimate there. Um, the other thing that was interesting is um, we solicited advice from a health technology assessment agency NICE in the UK during the design of the study, and I'll mention that as well, because that is now a, an offering which is being made to inform the design of such studies. So I start by showing you some of the qualitative research, and the, the two publications are both mentioned on the screen here. Um, the first was social media listening, which was listening to online open forums um, like Facebook and uh, others. And what we did was um, analyze the symptoms that were talked about most online. And firstly, if you look at the red bars, this is what other stakeholders are talking about. And by other stakeholders, it could be physicians, pharmaceutical companies, regulators, et cetera. And by far and away, shortness of breath was the most commonly talked about symptom. 76% of the symptom mentions mentioned shortness of breath. And if you compare this to the blue bars, which is what patients are talking about online, you see a very different profile where cough was actually the most important, mucus clearance was the second most important, and shortness of breath was only in third place there. So it already indicated to us that there were things important to patients that they talked about um, in chat rooms or in forums with other patients there, which are different from what the, the rest of us are talking about there. And potentially that's related to um, the fact that most of the drugs that uh, we've been working on until now have focused on shortness of breath rather than these other symptoms. So the, the second part of the research is on the right-hand side, and we used the online bulletin board for this, which is a moderated chat room that ran for two weeks where you can ask on a day-by-day -day basis different questions to a um, group of about um, 10 to 20 patients there. And what came from that is that re relief of cough and mucus production, uh, um, as well as shortness of breath, are really the desirable aspects from the patient's point of view. Um, these are um, symptoms that they face on a daily basis and um, really the drugs that are currently available are not alleviating these symptoms at all. Secondly, there are some symptoms like um, sleep disturbance and urinary incontinence, which would seem to be a consequence of um, particularly the cough and the, the mucus there. And because of sleep disturbance and the effort involved in bringing up mucus. There was a, a large fatigue element there, which had a functional impact on their quality of life and their daily activities. Um, plus, <clears throat> plus there was a big social and emotional impact, the um, bringing up uh, mucus in public or coughing on public transport, for example, uh, were big barriers to, for them to overcome, which tended to make the patients stay at home and not go out and socialize as much as they would otherwise do. So that was the background to the study, and I'll move now into the design of the patient preference study. Um, so this, the, the aim of the study was to quantify the relative needs and preferences of COPD patients regarding these different symptoms and the impact on their quality of life and whether their preferences changed with certain respondent characteristics. So the primary objective was how much importance do they place on these different symptoms? So that's um, the cough and the mucus and consequences like incontinence and sleep disturbance as compared to the more traditional endpoints, shortness of breath and exacerbation. Um, and then we had other objectives there, which were defining the trade-offs that they would make between different disease states, whether you could generate utilities directly from the preference data, and then to explore heterogeneity of the overall population, be it by country or by how 
activated, motivated the patients were, or by the severity of the disease. Um, so Novartis um, led this study, and we worked with Adelphi, Adelphi Real World on this. Uh, we had two medical advisors um, supporting us throughout, one in the US and one in France. And we worked with patient, patient support groups in five countries. So this was the British L Lung Foundation, um, the Lung Foundation of Australia, uh, the COPD Foundation in the US, JBREF in Japan, and Fondation du Souffle in France. So in total, we had 1,050 patients in the study, 400 from the US, 200 in the UK, and 150 each in Japan, France, and Australia. So it's important to say a few words about the timing. So we actually began this work right at the beginning, beginning of phase one, uh, where we had a very early development project uh, with the intention that the results of the patient preference study would help to inform the phase three clinical trial design, both in terms of patient reported outcomes and digital evidence capture in that study. Um, the qualitative research was conducted in 2018. And in November of 2018, we solicited um, scientific advice from NICE in the UK, the HTA, Health Technology Assessment Agency there. And that was at the end of the qualitative research to help inform the design of the quantitative survey. I'll show you some of the um, results of that scientific advice on a subsequent slide. The pre-testing happened in February to June of 2019 of our discrete choice experiment and the online survey. And the final survey data collection happened between September and December of 2019. Luckily, just before COVID broke, which uh, especially for a respiratory condition was um, very important. And the results are being used now to inform the design of a clinical core outcome set in COPD, core COPD, which is being conducted by the Center for Medical Technology and Policy in the US together with Green Park. So this just summarizes the advice that we got from NICE. It was the first time ever that um, advice had been sought on the design of a preference study and resulted in a um, press release on the NICE website. And we got really valuable recommendations from this, which led to an improvement in the design of our study. Um, we discussed a lot about the mucus attribute and how best to capture that within the um, design from the discrete choice experiment. Uh, we, uh, the recommendation was for a full profile and we discussed a number of attributes, also about potential illogical interactions in the discrete choice design, um, the need for pilot testing, um, the sort of statistical analysis and the sample size, the inclusion criteria and the target patients and how that would relate to the patients in our own clinical studies, um, which PRO instruments to build alongside the discrete choice experiment in the study design and a request from NICE to include EQ5D in the study. Um, we decided on the basis of the discussion to drop willingness to pay as one of the attributes. And we discussed also about the subgroup analyses that we would be performing so it was a very valuable experience and I could only recommend others that it's worthwhile to engage some of these stakeholders during the design phase, not just after you've got the results. So the study population is shown here. Um, patients had to be 40 years of age or older with a diagnosis of COPD and experienced daily cough and mucus, um, excess mucus secretion, and to have experienced um, at least one um, COPD flare-up or exacerbation in the last 12 months. Um, the recruitment strategy was first and foremost through the patient support groups in the five countries that we were working in. And once we reached saturation of that, we included um, patient panels to um, reach the overall target numbers. So this shows the overall design of the survey. And what's interesting, you've, you've got the six discrete choice experiment attributes listed down the right-hand side. So there's the two classical endpoints, the um, exacerbation and the shortness of breath, and then the four new ones that we're interested in, mucus, 
cough, the sleep, and the incontinence. Um, but you see in the middle that this was only one part of the overall survey. So we began with a patient screener. Uh, we then collected sociodemographic and clinical data from the patients um, before they went into the discrete choice experiment exercise. Um, they then um, had to fill out two online um, PRO tools. So they're both um, COPD related ones, the comp COPD assessment test and the cough and sputum assessment questionnaire. Um, we included an attitudinal instrument, which was looking at the motivation that patients had to manage their health and uh, um, wellness. Uh, we then had questions related to disease-related measures. Um, the EQ5D, which is a generic health-related quality of life instrument, and last but not least, a, a patient survey experience at the end. Um, the overall survey took around 35 minutes to run. It was done in their local language, and we did pre-testing in 30 patients before we fully launched the survey. So it, it's worth just so it's talking a little bit about how we captured attributes within the discrete choice experiment. Um, because you're limited to a maximum of seven, we had six in ours. And one of the conversations we had with NICE was about, well, PROs exist, can't you use those? And the problem is a PRO instrument often has 10 or many more questions to it, and you can't squeeze that down to the size that's necessary within a single attribute on a discrete choice experiment. So if we look in the middle here at sleep as one of the things we're interested in, you could ask about how many days a week you have disturbed sleep, how many times a night uh, does it affect you, how long do you spend awake, or how long you take to get back to sleep. So disturbed sleep can have uh, many different components to it, uh, but we didn't have the liberty to ask all of this. So we chose a very functional solution to this, which was um, asking the question, when you wake up on a typical day, do you feel rested or just somewhat rested or not rested at all, really? And we applied this sort of more functional attributes um, throughout each of the um, um, attributes we were looking at in our attribute level grid. So this is the final table, the six attributes that we were looking at. Um, they go from um, some of the attributes like exacerbation are during a typical year, others which are during a typical day, the shortness of breath, the cough, and the incontinence, and then two of them, the mucus and sleep is referring to when they wake up in the morning. So five of the attributes had a, a more daily aspect to it, and one of them was a, an annual event. Of the levels here, we had three levels for all of them, with the exception of shortness of breath, which had a fourth level, as you see. Um, they go from level one is the sort of best health state, if you like. So um, shortness of breath is only experienced during very strenuous activity compared to level four, which would be shortness of breath even when sitting down or lying down. So for each of the attributes here, level one would be the, the best possible health state, and level three or four is the worst condition. Now, when we did the pre-testing, there was a, a challenge that some of the patients confused the exercise of um, trying to convey what was their current health state as opposed to what would be the most desirable health state. And that inspired us to create this exercise, which we've called a profile matching exercise into the study. So before they did the discrete cho the choice experiment, they got to see the entire attribute and level grid, as you see it here. And for each of the attributes, they could click on the one which most um, was most similar to their current health state. And you see that um, in the gray boxes here, for most cases, it was the middle attribute level two that they chose with the single exception of incontinence where they selected level one as their, the most common there. So that was an interesting exercise because it helped to orientate them between, okay, first we've asked you what you're currently like, now we're going to go on and ask what would be your preferred choice. Um, but we were also able to use that same experiment um, subsequently. And um, this is how we used it. So that this um, 
profile matching exercise allowed us for each of the patients to know exactly what their current health status is. And from the discrete choice experiment, we were able to derive individually their preference weights for each of the attributes there as well. And this allowed us to create an index for each patient um, from the best possible health, which would have a score of one to the worst possible health overall across these six attributes were a score of zero. And we also in our study included EQ5D, which was um, also scored between um, zero and one. And it allowed us to do a direct um, correlation exercise between the um, results from the preference study and the um, importance of pa patients placed on their symptoms and the EQ5D data. And Byron will show you the results of that as well. So that was the design of the study. And I'll stop sharing now and pass over to Byron, who'll take you through the results. Yes, as Nigel said, I'll uh, carry on and talk about the results of the study and then summarize some key learnings that we had from the study. So on this screen is a graphical representation of the results uh, we obtained from fitting a statistical model to the data obtained from the discrete choice experiment. And uh, I'll try and explain uh, how to interpret the, the figure. So we have, going from left to right, in the middle of the screen here, we have these sets of connected lines, and above them is the name of the attribute that uh, they refer to. So uh, if you look at uh, the left-hand side exacerbations uh, set of lines, for example, uh, we see these uh, numerical values uh, which are above the uh, attribute levels. So on the horizontal axis, we have for each attribute the levels um, that uh, we used in the discrete choice experiment. So for uh, exacerbations, the levels are never experienced, requires antibiotic steroids, or requires a hospital stay or visit. So going from uh, best to worst, going from left to right. And the numerical values are fitted parameters from a statistical model, and they represent the desirability or relative utility to the patient of being in that uh, state at that particular level. And uh, the figures are relative, so it's not so much the values themselves, but the, the gaps between them. And so if you were uh, someone who had never experienced uh, an exacerbation and you were moved into a state where you required antibiotics, reduction in your utility or desirability uh, for, for, that, for that move is the distance between these two numbers here. And so if you went from the middle level to the worst level, you see a much larger drop. And uh, that's done for each of the other five attributes. The, the thing I want to point out is that in terms of importance of attributes, uh, if we look at the upper figure and compare it to the lower figure, that difference, the vertical distance, in fact, between you know, the two points here, we have a measure of uh, importance, and, and we have ranked the, uh, the attributes from now left to right in terms of, of this uh, value of importance. And you can see that you know, going from left to right, cough as a single um, attribute is the worst, uh, at least preferred, sorry, and uh, exa exacerbations is considered the most important um, so I should say least important, not most preferred. So, uh, of course, um, I have to move my picture out of the way, sorry. Um, bing. These were tested for statistical significance, and all these attributes are actually statistically significant. And therefore, you know, the results show that all five attributes are of importance to patients. And it's worth pointing out that while treatments are available for managing breathlessness and exacerbations, which are you know, familiar endpoints in clinical trials, the other daily symptoms are poorly addressed by current therapies. And uh, as a word of caution, I've looked at the attributes one at a time in my sort of description, but we should uh, be, be cautious that we need to interpret them as uh, together because interrelationships between them are important. So cough, mucus, accumulation, breathlessness, for example, can lead to sleep disturbance. 
and also resulting in exacerbations. So we're conscious that it's a combination of um, symptoms that are important to patients. The study, as Nigel said, was uh, 1,050 patients uh, recruited from five countries. And therefore, uh, we were interested to look at evidence of patient heterogeneity in the preferences. And so we, on the slide here, I've looked at three particular groupings of, of patients. So the first one is in terms of uh, geographic uh, differences over the five countries. And what we saw was that the results were very consistent and only small differences were seen. And in particular, the shortness of breath was the most important attribute for patients in Australia and France, and sleep disturbance, the most important for patients in Japan. But overall, you know, the, the, the pattern of preferences was very consistent within the five countries. Patient activation, this PAMQ measure, uh, which is measures how motivated patients are to uh, take control and management of their health uh, this, uh, again, there were some differences uh, by country, but again, the, the relative importance of the attributes uh, was still very consistent uh, over the four activation levels um, that this measure has. And then in terms of severity of disease, um, we used a, a scale which then put patients into either a mild, moderate, or severe state. And within each then looked at the, the pattern of preferences. And again, it was generally consistent across these three uh, categories. Uh, as might expect, severe patients did tend to rate exacerbations more highly than mild to moderate patients, presumably because that's something they're at a higher risk of experiencing. Now, as... Uh, a follow up and you know, make more use of the results. We uh, created what we call a simulation tool. And I'll briefly explain uh, what that is on this slide. Uh, the upper part of this slide is just a reminder of the results that you've seen. Um, well, I didn't show you this picture, but the relative importance I talked about uh, exacerbations being the, mo the most important going down to cough. And over here are those um, relative utility parameter estimates. Now, the simulation tool is a way of comparing two different health states. And you know, if you imagine a large population of patients and you offer them uh, a choice between two health states, we'd like to know the proportion that's preferred in that population, proportion, uh, the proportion rather, that prefer health state one compared to health state two. So we have um, created this, this Excel uh, tool where you specify one health state. For example, uh, health state one here is, uh, I think, the middle state uh, of every um, attribute. And then if you compared that to an equally attractive state, you would expect in the population that 50% would prefer state one and 50% would prefer state two. There wouldn't be any reason to distinguish between the two states if they were equally preferable. Whereas if you then give uh, a state which is uh, some element of uh, pre preference, you would expect the share to move in favor, the preference share to move in favor of that uh, health state. So for example, if I change um, light activity for shortness of breath to strenuous activity, and for urine, a uh, few drops of urine going to no urine. So basically moving one level uh, to a, a better state uh, on those two uh, attributes and leaving the rest uh, the same. Uh, we would see in the simulator that, uh, imagine a population of patients that 63% of them now would prefer to be in state two compared to state one. And the, the usefulness to us in the company uh, for having such a tool is to evaluate different scenarios on uh, what matters to patients. So for example, um, we could look at a scenario where uh, A, where cough and mucus are improved. Um, when we say improved, we can think of, um, if you like, the, the modal level where it's the patient is at the most attractive level at, you know, for each attribute, and then move them uh, one side or the other. And here we've moved the cough and mucus uh, to be an improvement of one step uh, compared to 
keeping everything else the same, you know, starting again and just moving shortness of breath. And we can see that patients would, on the whole, you know, prefer to have cough and mucus improved rather than only having you know, shortness of breath improved. And a more involved example here, we can look at the acute symptoms, shortness of breath, cough and mucus, uh, improving those compared to, to a, a state where we only improve exacerbations. And again, you can see that um, there is a, a, a larger proportion of patients would prefer to be in state A. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly that you know, cough, mucus, and shortness of breath are daily um, events that uh, people will suffer from. And uh, exacerbations are very serious, are quite rare. So maybe improving your daily uh, quality of life, you know, is more attractive than the risk of having uh, a rare exacerbation. But uh, we shouldn't forget, of course, the traditional endpoints are important, and these are the ones that are targeted for use in current gold standard treatment: uh, you know, shortness of breath and exacerbations. However, you know, what we're seeing in our results is that there's a clear potential for consideration in clinical trials of novel endpoints, which will now deliver patient-recognized benefit equivalent to or even greater than traditional endpoints, depending on the scenario, uh, as predicted by our preference share analysis, the one I just showed you, uh, example two, for example. Nigel mentioned that um, in, in the survey, we collected uh, lots of additional information, as well as the, the patients doing the discrete choice experiment. And we asked them, as Nigel said, to give a, um, to, to match themselves to the attribute levels. So we have for every um, patient, uh, the, the level on each attribute that best matches themselves. And also we collected uh, the EQ5D scores. And uh, what we've been doing uh, as a additional research project uh, within Novartis is to derive what we're calling um, a, a more disease-focused measure of quality of life. So from the output of the um, DCE experiment, we have those fitted uh, relative utilities I showed you. Well, what I've done is to take those and scale them in such a way that um, they become weights. So we add them uh, depending on the level uh, of a particular attribute. Uh, and it's done in such a way that if a patient has the best score on every attribute, all six attributes, this uh, the weights would add up to zero. Uh, sorry, to one, I beg your pardon, if they're at the best score. And if they are at the worst score, the, the weights would add up to one. And if you are somewhere in between the best and the worst combinations of levels, you would have a score between zero and one. And uh, on this left-hand picture, I've plotted uh, the EQ5D score that was recorded on uh, a patient with this newly created uh, COPT total health utility score. And you can see that there is quite a good uh, positive relationship between the two of them. Uh, which is uh, technically what we call convergent validity. So we have two different measures of quality of life, and they are broadly in line with each other. Uh, however, you know the the difference is that EQ5D is a generic uh, measure. It has uh, five dimensions, you know, which look at mobility, self care, uh, usual activities, pain, discomfort, anxiety, depression. So much more general um, state of health. Uh, and we are actually perhaps in our study, we are more interested in the COPD focused health score. However, the two are you know, working in the same direction. As a sort of a face validity, just making sure it's going in the right direction when it should. We also have uh, in the survey asked patients to give a, a, a self-reported severity level uh, going from one being good to four being the worst. And looking within each uh, of the levels, these are box plots which summarize the data at each level. Uh, but the little square in the middle of the box is the mean for that uh, severity level. And you can see as we go from left to right, that is going from uh, less severe to more severe, the the new score for COPD health is, is actually going in the right direction. It's going down also.
So we hope we'll publish um, something on this uh, you know, before too long. Uh, a part of the survey is always to ask you know, how patients found the experience. And uh, we asked them to uh, whether they agreed or disagreed or were neutral on four aspects of the survey. Uh, so were the questions relevant? Um, did, the, did my answers show my real preference? Uh, was the survey easy to answer? Were the questions easy to understand? And overwhelmingly, you know, over 86% found that um, the survey was relevant, interesting, and easy to answer uh, and understand. And in terms of the length of the survey, I think it was about 35 minutes or thereabouts that Nigel mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so most 84% found it a manageable or very manageable survey to undertake. And they found it interesting um, or very interesting, 86% of them. So again, the survey seemed to be a successful uh, experiment. Uh, Looking over you know, the results that we obtained, uh, we, we have some insights that we obtained. And I think using a DCE type of study where you know, we can look at uh, what matters to patients in terms of attributes and levels, I think that was um, indicates that studies like this you know, are worth considering. Uh, and the preference study being a DCE allowed us to quantify how important and the value that would be created you know, through alleviating the symptoms. We took advice during the planning you know, from other stakeholders, and uh, Nigel's already mentioned our engagement with NICE, the, the body in the UK, but also the patient groups in the five countries you know, were consulted as well to help us you know, discover what matters most to people living with COPD. Regarding timing, um, as early as possible in the drug development life cycle is what we would advise. And we started this in what we call phase one, the very early phase of drug development. And this has been in time to inform you know, the pivotal or phase three clinical trial in regard to the choice of patient relevant endpoints. Uh, so not to underestimate how long these uh, studies can take to plan and run. So earlier the better. Uh, and also to have an impact then on the phase three trial. You know, we needed to be uh, well ahead in planning. The study design, I think a DC was a good choice here because it focused on you know, symptoms and attributes. And then you know, the output let, lends itself to further analysis, you know, something like the uh, use that we were able to put to the simulation tool. So I think the study design uh, was, was a good choice. Uh, Nigel mentioned further work that's now undergoing. Uh, we have a collaboration with Green Park Collaboration, which we are working with to help them uh, to develop a core outcome set. So the core outcome set are the minimum set of um, relevant endpoints that you'd like to collect in a, a randomized clinical trial. And so we hope that uh, we can bring the, the patient's perspective you know, into that choice as well. And so, as we say in bold here, with particular focus on patient important aspects, and particularly, you know, the symptom burden, which perhaps isn't captured directly in you know, traditional endpoints. And that's the end of my section. So I think Nigel and I would you know, welcome uh, your questions and we'll do our best to answer them. Thank you. I am seeing that there's a few comments already in the chat here. So oh, okay. the first one I see is, um, can you comment on how the results of the preference study impacted influenced the endpoints used in the phase three trial? Well, the phase three trial hasn't started yet. We're still um, preparing that. As I said, this uh, preference study began very early in the life cycle. Um, but the, the good news is that all of the endpoints that we mentioned here, so the traditional ones, exacerbations, hospitalizations, shortness of breath, as well as the newer ones, um, cough, ex, uh, mucus, sleep disturbance, and incontinence are all intended to be included in the phase three trial design using a combination of patient reported outcomes, patient electronic diaries, 
and digital evidence capture as well. So um, in that respect, yes, it did have an influence. And there's a, a question also about um, comorbid disease or something. So um, yes, of course, we captured this. Um, so there was a four, a just got notes in front of me here. Asthma, 44% of them had a co concomitant asthma, 40% hypertension, 34% had some allergic disease, 25% depression, anxiety, and then a long list beyond that. So we're, we're actually in the process of submitting the manuscript and the full list of comorbidities will be included there. And a question from NICE, um, did we discuss how they could inform health uh, HTA? It, it was an experiment for both ourselves and NICE when we did this because neither of us had uh, you know, experience before of um, a HTA body giving input to the design of a preference study. And we didn't get as far as how this would ultimately be used, but it was quite clear and they, they wanted that the conversation was focused in and around a drug development program and the data that would come out of that. So um, they were quite open to understanding how much importance patients would place on these different symptoms and then how that would feed into the analysis and the value equation. Um, the, uh, my understanding from NICE is that they're less keen on a sort of quantitative numerical output from a preference study, but more the deliberative conversation as to the value to the patients. And that's, I believe, how they see preference research being used to fully understand how much value patients place on this. I see there's a more statistical question uh, from Paul. Um, I'm assuming it's referring to our new um, COPD total health utility uh, score. Um, and if it is uh, the way that it was calculated, um, it will be explained in the paper that we're writing. But the basic idea is that um, all, the calculation is actually directly done via the, the output from the DCE model. So we have those fitted parameters. Um, you now, for DCE, there were the three parameters going from, I think, 0.74 down to uh, minus something. And that, those are uh, indications of the relative importance of the levels. And basically, uh, the scaling took those. Well, Nigel mentioned we also had the, the, the matching exercise. So for every individual patient, I have a list of the levels for each of the six attributes. And then I can attach to each of those levels um, a scaled version of that utility score and um, scaled in such a way that, as I said, if I add them up for uh, someone who's got the best level on all six attributes, it would come to one, and it would be zero if it was the worst level on all six. So it's um, I didn't have to ask any more questions uh, to get that information. The, the, the matching exercise gave me a list of levels for each um, patient that matched their current state of health, and then using the uh, fitted parameters uh, with some a little bit of uh, calculation to get them scaled in in a, in a way that I needed them, I could uh, create this new score. Um, I don't know if that is sufficient uh, as an answer, but as a, we are collaborating with uh, Professor Mandy Ryan at the University of Aberdeen, to, which is based, the scoring uh, formula that I'm using is based on something she's done. So we hope uh, in the coming months we will have a paper submitted for the review and publication, hopefully. Seeing the next question here asking about the, the fact that there are a number of PROs that capture some of these concepts, symptoms in COPD and how we link to that. Now, the clin what we've done with the preference study is show which are the symptoms that matter and how much they matter to patients. And the conclusion is all of these six that we looked at are important to them to varying degrees. Um, and especially if you start to look at them in, in combination and uh, potential drug benefits, which would affect several of these. When it comes to designing the clinical trial, that's when you sort of step back to the 
available PROs, validated PROs. Um, so I mentioned two in the course of the uh, that we use um, in our online study. One of them is the COPD assessment test, and the other is the cough and sputum assessment questionnaire. So these are the sorts of PROs which will be included now in the clinical trial design, along with digital evidence capture and e-diaries on sleep patterns, for example, there. So I think that they work in concept, the, the preference study showing you what's important, and then the PRO instruments being how you then capture this within the design of the clinical trial. Hope that answers the question. And then there's a, another question question I'm seeing here, which is whether that we saw a difference in the preferences of patients from panels and patient organizations. I don't know that we did an exact analysis of that, but from since the preferences were generally consistent across countries and severities, we really didn't see too much difference there. There was an extreme consistency of preferences across the entire sample there, um, but it's not something to my knowledge that we specifically called out. Um, that it, there's an interesting um, follow on to that question, and that is the potential biases in the recruitment that you use. And you have to be conscious that patients who are members of a patient group may have a specific active interest in their disease. And the same could also be true of um, patients who sign up for patient panels as well. So there could be similar motivations in both groups of patients there, but it's not something that we've looked at their preferences separately. Carl, did we miss any other questions there? I answered most of the ones that I saw. Try indeed, to. indeed. I think these are all questions and you answered all of them. Anybody else wanted to Ask any questions? I think what's what's nice about this research is a, a traditional discrete choice experiment focus on drug profiles, drug A versus drug B, and making a choice between that and we chose not to go that way with this design. We instead focused just on symptoms of the disease, which is a fairly uncommon design. But when it's the endpoints for trials that you're trying to focus on, then I believe it's really the way to go to have this symptom-based or health state-based uh, design of a um, preference study. And it, it worked very well in our case. Yeah, I comment on uh, the matching exercise that was done. I think um, it was part of the educational sort of training, getting in preparation for doing the DC. But I think if we can record such a thing each time, uh, as you saw, you know, we can make a lot of use of that later because it provides um, you know, the profile of each individual patient, and we can then link that, you know, to the COPD score that I created. Um, uh, the the EQ5D scores and so on. So I think um, I think that was uh, a, a lucky uh, sort of outcome that uh, doing something to help the patients understand better led to something that actually was statistically very useful. I see there's a new question about yeah. um, convincing cross-functional colleagues. It's an ongoing job is all, all I would say there. Um, one of the important things is how how you communicate the results. Preference studies are quite new for many people, and I, you know, we have we've had to learn as we've gone forward on how best to effectively communicate the results because you can generate you know hundreds of PowerPoint slides out of one of these studies and um, tie people in knots. You get people who are confused between a patient reported outcome and a patient preference study. So it's been a, a sort of slow process that we've been chipping away at for more than five years. And gradually, I think it's starting to take hold within our organization. Um, I think the, the most compelling evidence will come when you see regulatory bodies, FDA, EMA, as well as HDA bodies, taking heed of this in their decision making when they're seeing that based on what's come out of a preference study that people have then 
studied in clinical trials what matters to patients and hopefully shown positive evidence of a drug on those things and then get the right result uh, um, the label and the reimbursement level um, commensurate with the value that it's bringing there. So that will really um, shift the needle significantly in my eyes. Starting early, um, it's, it's an interesting one because clearly you, if you want to inform the design of endpoints in phase three, then you need to be starting at the beginning of phase one, if not before then. And you know, typically to do the qualitative work and then the preference study as well, it can be anywhere between one and two years to um, run through that. So you need need to start early. The problem is there's a lot of um, risk at that stage of the pipeline. Drugs can fail early on. And so people are reluctant to put a lot of money behind um, these studies very early on. Um, so I think you have to... To pick the situations where you believe a preference study is most likely to make an impact. And the funny thing is, a disease like COPD, there are many drugs on the market. Um, we ourselves have, have several drugs in COPD, and you would have assumed that what matters to patients would have been captured already by the trials out there. But as we found, that's not the case. And so even in some of these well-researched diseases, there's a need to go back to understand from a patient's perspective what matters for, to them, um, and then work with your colleagues in clinical development, um, the PRO team, to make sure that um, we can bring those patient-relevant endpoints into the trials. Um, 